Hello my bookish friends out there in booktube land and welcome to another episode of Tristan and the Classics. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at seven classic books which are very well worth your time reading. And they're actually the seven books that um, in our Patreon group we've been through over the last six months. So I'm just going to take you one by one about what they're about, some of the ideas and, and things that you can get from these books, and uh, see which ones appeal to you. So without further ado, let's get stuck in, shall we? The first book that we went through over on my Patreon was in the month of January and it was Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. This is the Everyman edition, a, a lovely cloth bound um, sort of claret red colour um, with beautiful paper as well. Lovely to read. So Great Expectations. You may have read some Dickens, you may never have read him. I would always encourage you to read some Dickens and if I could recommend a place to start I would suggest Great Expectations. Um, because it is such a phenomenally good book. Now, to say how good Dickens is, the Russian tradition of writers, so you look at Lamentov and Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and Turgenev, they all held Dickens in high regard. Now that says a lot. And yet, he's not like the Russian tradition. He uses a lot of humours. We discussed the humours in the Patreon group. In fact, I've done a video on YouTube about the humours, which if you're trying to get into literature, I would highly recommend you watch that one. I'll put a link in the description. Now, Great Expectations, really what it's about is the ideals that we decide to try and live up to, where we set our expectations in life, what we think a good life is. Some would say what it takes to be a real gentleman. Um, I th think that's too narrow a slice really. What's going on is what do we set our expectations on and how often are we in influenced by those around us? What Dickens excels at in like all of his books is he's never lost his sense of childhood wonder. He, he can write children like nobody else and Pip starts off as a child in this book. It's a Bildung's romance so starting from childhood up to your adulthood. And the way Pip sees the world so simply, so naively as a child makes you smile because you remember being like Pip. But we see him grow and through introductions to higher society, it's his change of his humble origins, change of his opinion of those humble origins. And then he gets money, gets sent to London where he wants to become a, a gentleman. He wants great expectations for himself. And we meet a host of brilliant characters typical of Dickens, and then how the the whole situation resolves itself um, for Pip. Uh, there's some unexpected turns. Now, I could read you very humorous sections from this book, but to give you an idea of, of just how well Dickens writes, there's a section in this book, one paragraph I'll read, and it's dealing with a, a moment he's gone into this eccentric woman's house called Miss Havisham. And the whole house has gone into decay because she's frozen in time, as it were. And just listen to this description. I crossed the staircase landing and entered the room she indicated. From that room, too, the daylight was completely excluded, and it had an airless smell that was oppressive. A fire had been lately kindled in the damp, old-fashioned grate, and it was more disposed to go out than to burn up and the reluctant smoke which hung in the room seemed colder than the clear, clearer air, like our own marsh mist. Certain wintry branches of candles on the high chimney piece faintly lighted the chamber, or it would be more expressive to say faintly troubled its darkness. It was spacious, and I dare say had once been handsome, but every discernible thing in it was covered with dust and mould and dropping to pieces. The most prominent object was a long table with a tablecloth spread on it, as if a feast had been in preparation when the house and the clocks all stopped together. An epern or centrepiece of some kind was in the middle of this cloth. It was so heavily overhung with cobwebs that its form was quite indistinguishable. And, as I looked along the yellow expanse, out of which I remember it seeming to grow like a black fungus, I saw speckled-legged spiders with blotchy bodies running home to it and running out from it, as if some circumstance of the greatest public importance had just transpired in the spider community. 
Isn't that just beautiful writing? He evokes atmosphere so well. You know, the, the way that the troubled darkness, but then he says how the candles actually, the light troubles the darkness. Um, it gives you that real sense of how dim the lighting is, where it's like hard, there's a light on, but actually it seems to make it harder to see because of that light. That's the kind of writing you get with Charles Dickens. And what a phenomenal book. We thoroughly enjoyed going through this together. Now in February, we went through our second book in the group, and that was Balzac's Old Gorio. The reason we looked at Balzac is you could say that Balzac is the French Dickens, or Dickens is the English Balzac. Balzac, not so heavy on using humours um, in his characters uh, as Dickens, although he does do it. But Balzac and Dickens are very similar. Both of them seem to want to capture all of life. If you've read anything about Dickens or read his works, you know that London features prominently. London is almost a character. In Balzac's work, Paris is the same for him. Paris is this character. The difference with Balzac is all of his books were written in what was called uh, La Comédie Humaine. humaine. Um, my French is terrible. And it means the human comedy. All of his books were exploring various aspects of different characters and different stations of life. And what's interesting about these works, of which there are a multitude, is that when you read, like later on, there's a book that comes up and one of the main characters in this book turns up in a later book. Which means you get characters stepping into the scene who you know the backstory to. They don't just appear out of nowhere like in most books. Now, what this book is so good at, we've got a, a lot of focus on the corrupting power of money in this book. And it's very interesting to watch. You've got all these characters in the pension vacaire. Pension means a hotel. And you've got Madame Vacaire who wants to be more than she is. Um, it's, a, you know, it's not the plushest of institutions. But old Gorio is this old man who occupies one of the rooms and he's formerly a vermicelli maker and has a lot of money. People don't know where he got that money from. No one took the time to investigate or ask him. And then certain girls come to see him. And of course the rumours in the pension are that he's a dirty old man and he's paying prostitutes. But there are a multitude of other characters, one of whom is the young man Rastignac. And in some respects, although, you know, Old Gorio is the namesake of the book, Rastignac is the centrepiece because he's this guy, lad, who's come from a family who is supposed to be noble, but they've got no money and they're resting all their hopes on him going to university, establishing himself maybe in law and being able to provide for the family. But he gets to look at Olgorio, he starts getting to know him and admires the man for his character. But there are others with a much more cynical view who talk to Rastignac. Uh, Vautran is one. Vautran turns up in three of Balzac's books. Um, and by the way, they're not cons you don't have to read the books of Balzac consecutively. Um, what's amazing though is the effect of a young man looking at the world and seeing relatively clearly how trying to be good and trying to get on are almost choices of either or. If you want to get on in, in this sort of early 19th century France, you need money and you need connections and you need not to have morals. Morality, according to one of the people speaking to Rastignac, is, a, is success. If you're successful, that's a virtue. It's not about being morally good. Virtue is not moral. It's about whether you succeed or not. And what happens to Rastignac? It's quite interesting how the book ends because we see Rastignac going through quite a bit of turmoil in his view of everybody. I'll just read you one little section to give you a flavour of, of the, the writing, as it were. Obviously, it's a translation because Balzac wrote it in French. But it says... At once there shone before his eyes the wealth displayed at the Comtesse de Restaud's mansion. He had seen there the luxury which a Mademoiselle Gorio was bound to love, the gilding, the expensive objects prominently displayed, the indiscriminating splendour of the newly rich, the senseless extravagance of the courtesan. This fascinating picture was eclipsed by a sudden vision of the imposing Hôtel de Beaucien, 
As his imagination soared among the giddy heights of a Parisian society, a thousand dark thoughts stirred in his heart. His views grew broader and his conscience slacker. He saw the world as it is. Saw how laws and moral judgments are without power among the rich and found in success the ultima ratio mundi. So ultima ratio mundi um, is sort of the last argument of the world. Um, more famous phrase would be ultima uh, ratio regum, which is the, the last argument of the king, which is force. What he's saying here, Rastignac sees the world, Parisian society as it is, that money, not morals, is the ultimate argument of the world that he inhabits. But how does he respond to that? What about the tussle in his, inside him? And when you read this, what a classic is so good at, is it still applicable today? As is Dickens' Great Expectations. People have not changed. And you read these two books, they're great to read side by side. Um, and then stop and walk around in the world that you inhabit now and let those authors' words impress on you and see what you feel. So that was the second book. Now in the month of March, we read Mary Barton by Elizabeth Gaskell, and in the month of April, we read Sybil by Benjamin Disraeli. I was very ill in April, and I, I, I never got to do a full-blown video of this, so I really, I need to go back and do that. But these two books are very interesting to read together. Neither of these would you class as the great classics. So why read them? Well, there's a very simple reason, and we, I, I arranged them back to back because it was to develop a backdrop of society upon which much of the classics, when you read, it gives you an insight into what society really was like. Mary Barton is an incredibly good story. Um, it's overshadowed by the two more famous of Gaskell's works, which are North and South and Cranford. Cranford um, basically being popularised by the BBC uh, series, which, if you haven't watched it by the way, is a phenomenal series to go and watch. But Mary Barton, what happens here is Gaskell is taking a look at the lives of the poor in the industrial towns. She's making an appeal, not just in defence of the poor, sort of calling out the landowners and the factory owners, but also an appeal to the poor about how they go about righting their wrongs. Um, her husband was a pastor and they were quite evangelical. But there's nothing of religion in this book. What it does do is it's sympathetic because as a pastor's wife, she was involved constantly in visiting the poor, seeing them in situ in their filthy hovels, in basements, in freezing cold weather. When there was a, a demise of coal for cotton in the factories, well, they were laid off work. What would that bring? The starvation. So what you've got here is you have um, John Barton. He loses his wife uh, in childbirth. So she's giving birth and she dies. Now, that's not giving anything away. It's right at the beginning. What happens to John then, trying to take care of those who are left, particularly Mary, his daughter? Um, you see a change come over him and the anger felt because of the hostile conditions they have to live in, which he feels has caused the death of his wife. Mary is a good soul, but she's also, there's a love interest in this with Jem Wilson. Um, and someone else is also interested in her who is much richer. So we get that sort of love triangle thing going on. There's a host of different characters who are very real characters. You know, the ones that are gossips and also the ones that are troublemakers. But overall, what we're focusing on here is what the conditions of the industrial town poor was like. And I cannot tell you how important it is to get that as something to lay as a proper backdrop to every story. It's easy to read stories as just stories, which of course they are, um, and invent your own backdrop for every single one of them. But when you read books like this, it allows you to create an environment, a world, upon which your classic authors were actually writing. So you think of Dickens, okay, writing Great Expectations. That was written around the same time as this work. So Dickens would have been aware of the hardships of the poor. We know that 
but the northern poor here, the industrial towns. He would have been aware of what's known as the Reform Bill. In Patreon, we had a video all on just what the Reform Bill in Britain meant um, and its impact on the poor. All of this helps you understand the society that the classics were written in. It takes them from just stories to real life. And that's why I chose that we would read Mary Barton. Also a phenomenally good story. There's a bit of hold your breath, you know, a race against time, as it were. There's some of that comes involved. There's a great scene with a fire. Um, so there's action in there. But, oh, and there's some serious intrigue and mysterious characters arriving under lampposts, you know, and then vanishing again. Who's that? There's so much sympathy in this book. And what's so good is there's no vitriol. I mean by the authoress here. There's no vitriol. Neither does she lean heavily on the side of one group or the other. She tries to walk an even balanced line. And you can tell this is what great writing is. By using a story which encapsulates real the, the lives of real people. It's based upon the lives she's seen. She shows she understands both sides of the argument and wants each side, poor and rich alike, to talk to each other, to understand one another. And she feels that that is the way forward. So a very, very good book. Now, linked to this is Sybil by Benjamin Disraeli. What I love about this is they are very similar, but written from two end, different ends of the spectrum. Elizabeth Gaskell was not a well-to-do person. You know, she married quite a, a, a low-ranking curate. Benjamin Disraeli would become Prime Minister of Great Britain. And he also knew what it was to be an outsider with the Jewish background. But Sybil, he sort of takes you from the richer side of things. Whereas you focus on John Barton and family who are poor, the protagonist in this is uh, Lord Egremont. And he comes from the position of a privileged aristocratic society where his family are landowners and very early on you see the horrible conditions of the country poor, not just the industrial. We do end up in the city um, or in a town which is more industrial, but we see the country poor, the descriptions of the hovels and the way water from the, the, the runoff water from rain just empties into these places causing like typhus to thrive and the, the the noble families being somewhat indifferent to it using a higher ranking character he ends up being confronted with his own position but he meets a girl who is um, amongst one of the people she's she's a daughter of a chartist which we talk about in, in patreon the Chartist movement. They, they wanted the, the rights for the common man. They wanted all men to be able to vote. They wanted to have MPs that represented them who weren't just landowners who only looked after their own interest. So the Chartists were really, really looked down upon by those in power because, as you know, through all history, those in power, all they want to do is keep power. So anyone that wants to have an introduction to power, they're, they're going to fight that unless they're forced. And so having a man who's an aristocrat, like a, a girl whose father is a chartist, you know, there's a problem here. You'll see other things as well, the real background of British society, such as how the poor or those employed by massive factories were treated, like not paid in money, but paid in tokens, which they could only spend at the factory's tuck shop. So that the owners of the tuck shop, who also in the factories, could charge more for bacon, more for eggs than they could, than they would be able to buy it for in the street if they had real money. The discontent, the anger that's brooding, the sinister nature of the secret meetings at night that is in here, all very valuable for understanding the real class problems. And in a world today that has lots of opinions on things about how the past used to be, I recommend you read these books because when you read novels from the time period, what you will find out is what it was really like. I'll tell you why that's true. Because for people to read it and love a book, they had to recognise themselves in it. So rather than having a 21st century look back and we'll decide what people thought in the 19th century, read the novels because they identified with them. They knew them to be true. That's how to really get a true backdrop. 
not by any academic telling you what it was like back then. Read the works of authors from back then. In May, the book we took on was E.M. Forster's absolutely wonderful A Room with a View. What a brilliant book. Spectacular. Ian Forster writes with such liquid clarity. You know, it's so straightforward, his, his way of writing, his prose. There's, he captures the idyllic in Italy and in the countryside of Britain. But at the same time, he's got that sort of, uh, sort of not acerbic, that's too strong, a bitter aftertaste of satire in what he says about his characters. He manages to, to really polish his characters very, very well. And quite deliberately, he, uh, he sort of slightly exaggerate again is a hard word to use, but he does sort of bring to the fore certain elements of some of the characters, almost making them humours like Dickens, but obviously not as, not as grotesquely humorous as Dickens would do it. This book... The main story revolves around Lucy and, um, what's his name? George. So Lucy is on a travel through Italy. She's going on the European tour because that's what you do in high society. She's actually sort of upper middle class society. She's not aristocratic. And she's got a chaperone with her called Charlotte. When they meet these two men in um, at the pension Bertolini, and these two men, all of the well-bred English. I think these two men are uncouth because they don't conform to all the typical social mores that are expected. And there's a reason for that. And that's, that's the whole run of this book. It's an awakening for Lucy. There's an awakening in love, but there's an awakening also in seeing the world in its true beauty, not in its synthetic beauty which is crafted and created by artificial standards of of how to behave and what is good and proper and what is you know what is elegant rather than just enjoying life and this is what George has got George has this ability to just I mean he's quite bored with life but he does from his father get the ability to just see beauty and he just what he's lacking is actually love um, and then he meets Lucy but it's not as straightforward as you would imagine. And Lucy gets to start comparing the society she's come from and how stultified it is to just embracing life. There's a couple of other characters in this who have got very interesting roles. They're not quite cameos, they're more foils. Foils for the main characters to, to be polished with. Um, and to respond to. And some of them are really good characters, like nice, good. Um, but there's, you know, some funny scenes where proper characters get caught in very improper situations. And by improper, I don't mean salacious. I just mean not what the village or the neighbourhood would expect of their behaviour. The A Room with a View, the clue to the whole book is in its title. We all live in a room. Our whole life is a room. We sit in a structured, furnished arrangement of thoughts. But does our room have a view? And this comes in at the first chapter because there is a little discussion about not having a room in the hotel that has a good view over Florence. But the, it's a metaphor for do we have an outlook, broader horizons, or are we a closed room with no view? Because that's what Lucy finds in the rest of society. In her society that she's trapped in, their way of doing everything, like you go on the European tour, but you stay at a place where there's only English people. Because you can trust the English. You know, um, the, the Italians are, you know, they're a bit too much, a bit too Mediterranean for our liking. And they go to look at works of art based on a book which tells them everything they should think about that piece of art. <laughs> I mean, that's nonsense, isn't it? That's, that's not a room with a view. That's indoctrination. And actually, it's very apt considering how the world is today in trying to create people to see things a definite certain way, telling them what to see rather than letting them just see it for themselves and make their own judgment. It's a phenomenal piece of work. It is beautiful. It is subtle. It's got some delightful like phrases. 
And rather than say anything else, I just want to read you this, this, this paragraph. Wow, this is about Lucy feeling suppressed. She's got, deep within her, she's got eternity inside her breast, as it were. You want to experience life and enjoy everything, have adventure and just, you know, carpe diem. But she can't because there's a lingering Victorian ideology. This is the Edwardian days, so we're talking like 1908 upwards. And, well, I'll just read this. Just listen to how Forster describes the lot of young women. There is much that is immortal in this medieval lady, the idea of a lady from Victorian days. The dragons have gone. So have the knights, but still she lingers in our midst. She reigned in many an early Victorian castle, was queen of much early Victorian song. It is sweet to protect her in the intervals of business, sweet to pay her honour when she has cooked our dinner well, but alas, the creature grows degenerate. In her heart also there are springing up strange desires. She too is enamoured of heavy winds, vast panoramas and green expanses of the sea. She has marked the kingdom of this world, how full it is of wealth and beauty and war, a radiant crust built around the central fires spinning towards the receding heavens. Men, declaring that she inspires them to it, move joyfully over the surface, having the most delightful meetings with other men, happy not because they are masculine, but because they are alive. Before the show breaks up, she would like to drop the august title of the Eternal Woman and go there as her transitory self. What? What incredible writing. I mean, that is, it's just so good. It's worth reading the book just to get that paragraph, but the whole book is just magnificent. So that was the book for May that we read, A Room with a View. In June, our merry little band in Patreon took on two books as sort of a comparative read. And they're two books that you wouldn't necessarily think are related to each other, but it had been an idea of mine personally to read these two books side by side. And then I thought, well, why don't we do it as, as the group together? And that those two books are A Month in the Country by J.L. Carr, and the other one, I had to read it on Kindle because I've loaned it out to someone, was The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. I know that the majority of you, more of you will have read Gatsby than A Month in the Country, but I stress this book over and over again. Read this book, A Month in the Country. Both beautifully written. If you want to argue about who uses prose the best, then you would fall on Fitzgerald's side. If you want to argue about which story is best, that's really hard. That's really hard. Because A Month in the Country, what a book. I mean, this is just subtlety personified. Um, this, is, this leaves you with that breathless, deep, unforgettable feeling that you had the first time your crush, your first love, hugged you. You know, you, they, you, they may not have known you'd like them, but you watch them from afar and then one day you got a hug from them. Wow, you never forget that. It's deep, but it's quiet. That's the feeling this book leaves you with. Now, what is it about? So basically you've got a guy, Tom Birkin. He's just come back from the First World War and he goes to a small quaint village called Oxgoodby up north near the city of York. And He's there to restore an old fresco in an old church. The fresco is like from the, the 15th century. It's under whitewash and he's got to peel it all back. He starts off on the first two pages quite bitter. But as one of um, uh, the members in our Patreon group said, this book is almost like how the restoring of the painting heals him. There is a, there is a definite healing going on. And the optimistic view of life that comes about at the end of this book in a way that leaves you semi heartbroken but also uplifted beyond description is just phenomenal. Now the reason I picked this was because it focuses on a topic that Gatsby also focuses on or the great Gatsby and it's something to do with a past, the past memory, the past ideal 
Because in The Great Gatsby, you probably know, you've got Nick Carraway as the, the narrator, and he meets this guy called The Great Gatsby, who's throwing these wild, lavish parties, as made famous by Leonardo DiCaprio in the film by Baz Luhrmann. Now, he's throwing these parties, but because he wants to win back a girl he once loved called Daisy, but Daisy is married to uh, a guy called Tom, Tom Buchanan, who's a bit of a beast, an ogre. Um, nothing to like about him. But you see, Birkin, he has a situation that arises here which is perfect. You're screaming for him to reach out and take it. But what he does with this perfect moment is quite literally the opposite of what Jay Gatsby does with his perfect moment. And it's amazing to see two authors looking at a situation which all of us have in life. We all have memories. We all have, think of, you know, I go back to the first person you ever loved or had a crush on, right? Do you still feel something towards them? Probably because it got imprinted so deep on you. Unless you went out with them and it all fell apart and, you know. If you, never, if you never actually went out with them, you loved them from afar, that memory is forever burned on you. And those kind of memories, we often want to relive them. And that's essentially what both The Month in the Country and The Great Gatsby are looking at. Most people simplify, way oversimplify The Great Gatsby by saying it's about the American dream. Not really. I really, I really disagree with that. There's elements of it which are probably more overt than this one thing which Gatsby is focused on, which is at the crux of the whole novel. And it's also what Birkin does at the end of this book, um, which made me think immediately of The Great Gatsby um, and how different they were with the same situation, their different responses. Something else I'll say about The Great Gatsby and J.L. Carr's A Month in the Country is the symmetry in each book. They're both novellas. This is about 110 pages. Gatsby is 130 pages. But there's a symmetry in the writing. Look at how the characters are reflections of one another, are counterbalances. With Birkin in particular, it's there's a lot of historical characters. I don't mean it's a history, but there's a lot of dead people. Obviously, the painter who painted his fresco in the 15th century is dead, isn't he? But how he comes to connect with him through his work. There's also an archaeologist nearby who's looking for another person from the past. How these characters are symmetries of each other, the living and the dead, is quite amazing. With Gatsby, the symmetries are all alive. But nonetheless, it's a good example of, of how a, a novella is pleasingly crafted. I just wanted to read something from this book give you an idea of the writing. Um, can I find it? Right, here it is. It's just, what you do at the end of this book, can I just say, the thing to do when you've read this book, which you can do in a day, is go to one of the oldest places near you, remote if possible, and walk around with your eyes wide open and think of the lives lived. He's walking through a graveyard at this point. He's just come to the church he's going to work on. He's talked about the stones it's made of. He shows appreciation for details, the coping, the fact that there's no leaks from the guttering. Um, the restoration of some of the wall is done properly, not just with rubble, he says. And then we just get this, this phrase. He says, the graveyard wall was in good repair, although, surprisingly, the narrow gate's sneck was smashed and it was held to by a loop of binder twine. There were some good 18th century headstones, their lichens, stained cherubs, hourglasses and death's heads almost hidden by rank grass, nettle patches and fool's parsley. I glimpsed two or three spikes of a family grave overwhelmed by briars. A grey cat peered out, glared hostilely at me and was gone. Heaven knows what else was living there. Nowadays it would have been listed a wildlife sanctuary. So I came back to the little porch its stone sitting slabs, polished by 500 years rubbing from backsides of funeral parties, faint from incense or remorse. There's a nostalgia in that writing. There is a beauty of life in the attention to little tiny details. 
and a, a remembrance of lives lived. You know, we've got 500 years of funeral parties. We've got the gravestones. You know, the little spikes of them sticking out. There's a lot in this book that's just so touching and delicate. So, out of all those, which ones appeal to you most? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you wanted or were interested in just looking into the Patreon, it's um, $5.99 a month. I give about three different videos through the month. Um, and we've started having a bit of a discussion on Zoom now at the end of the month to go through the book. And if that sounds good to you, the link will be in the description below. So come over and try it out. You're not, you're not in for a complete term. You pay month by month. You can come in and out as you wish. Anyway, until the next time, I wish you joy in your reading.